Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Peter Gianetti, Editor-in-Chief of Home Rule Business, and welcome to the fourth installment of a six-part webinar series presenting the first ever International Housewares Association Market Watch Report. Once again, we have a panel of collaborators in the creation of the inaugural Market Watch, who will offer a revealing look into key consumer lifestyle trends identified by the report and how these trends intersect with the home and housewares business. Our panelists also will highlight how these trends and corresponding consumer attitudes and behaviors have been shaped by the COVID pandemic, and they'll outline implications for suppliers and retailers. Let's begin again with an introduction of the Market Watch authors and our webinar series panelists. We have Liana Salama, Vice President of Marketing for IHA, Joe Derachowski, Vice President and Home Industry Advisor for the NPD Group, and Tom Robley, Principal and Founder of Springboard Futures. The first three Market Watch sessions covered time, space, and experience. Today, we'll be looking at wellness. And just a reminder that we'll leave time for audience questions before the conclusion of today's session. You can post questions using the Q&A function along the bottom of the Zoom window. And recordings of each session will be available soon after their conclusion at the Inspired Home Show website, theinspiredhomeshow.com. So let's begin our day with an examination of wellness. The increased awareness of mental and physical health needs and to live healthier lives permeates all aspects of consumer purchasing decisions. Consumers want products they trust will improve their wellness and overall quality of life. With rising healthcare costs, consumers are taking responsi responsibility by enacting self-care. But before we explore the findings of the Market Watch report, we need to talk about what the term wellness encompasses. It seems like you can ask 10 people what it means and you'll get 10 different answers. So Tom, let's start with you. Uh, can you address what the current types of wellness are here? And maybe Joe, after that, talk a little bit about how that kind of uh, involves the home and housewares product categories. But Tom, let's start with you. What is, what is, what is wellness? Sure. Um, wellness is, you know, it's funny, wellness has gotten to be such a broad term. And I think the great thing about that is it's become extremely inclusive because of that. So now it's um, emotional wellness, spiritual wellness, certainly physical wellness, which is what we all tend to think of initially, but social, um, environmental, uh, financial, occupational, financial and occupational are things that have really crept into it the last year. But uh, you know, there are sort of eight dimensions of it. You can find more about it in our uh, in the IHA report, um, the Market Watch report. But uh, all, all told, it's an eighty-one billion dollar market right now, and uh, it's the reason for that is it's become incredibly inclusive. So it's not strictly just about people who even are healthy, but who want to be healthy in a myri in myriad ways. Right, Joe, uh, there was a time when I think people heard wellness, they thought of products like maybe air purifiers, blood pressure monitors, uh, uh, toothbrushes, but wellness really encompasses so much more. So what, kind of where does it fit in in the home and housewares uh, business from a kind of a category standpoint? It's all sort of connected, right? Yeah, it all is very, very much so. And it really has been driving our industry heading into the pandemic and because of the pandemic, it's even broadened the definition of health as what Tom is talking about. So it's really changed and it's, it's driving every sector of our business. As you mentioned with home environment, air purifiers has been incredibly hot before and even more so since. You've got floor care that is such a key component to it. You've got water filtration devices being an important part of personal care, as you said, with electric toothbrushes, hairstyling products that help try not to damage your hair. And then from a kitchen electrics and housewares perspective, it, it, it's across the board. It could be keto, which was the major driver heading into it and one of the biggest dieting changes. So if you think about that, you're doing coffee. And if that person does intermittent fasting with it, they're pounding coffee and water like crazy. So portable beverage wear. Things like olive oil and, and, and mortar and pesto to help you get your fats. Things like eggs uh, and all the different proteins and cutlery to help you get your proteins. Um, and all the cooking things go with it. I think the, the easiest way to think about it is historically, we would think it, health and wellness was eat more fruits, eat more vegetables, exercise more, 
And the fourth one historically was always eat more homemade, less processed foods. When we had tracked this over the past 30 years, those were the universal answers that you would always hear. Well, if I eat more homemade, less processed foods, that opens up everything. It opens up all the preparation devices, whether gadgets or cutting or, or cutting boards or things of that nature, to the heating advices, whether it's uh, uh, toaster ovens, uh, air fryers and multi cookers, whether it's the uh, pre serving, you know, tabletop plays a key component into it and serveware that we have, it, whether it is the storage part of it, uh, from food storage across the board, it really is about this ability to eat more homemade, less processed foods. Now, the foods are going to change, and that always varies over time, but the key is how can we help consumers in this space? Thanks, Joe. Leanna, it's, it's, wellness has almost moved from a way of life to the way of life, uh, and, and obviously the pandemic is this constant reminder of, of, of being well and taking care of yourself. As you look across the vista of the industry represented by the association, kind of where does wellness kind of come together as an opportunity to, uh, uh, to really kind of pull the industry together? Well, I think wellness as a concept exists as an opportunity in just about every product category at this point. And certainly as we talk a little bit about how the pandemic has shifted views and has put a renewed emphasis on, on wellness, um, you know, you see some additional opportunities that kind of crop up. But, you know, to kind of further what Joe is saying about how we eat and about what wellness has traditionally meant, you know, part of it, especially in how we eat and how we take in food, was always about, you know, fewer calories and less fat. It was about weight control, right? Weight management and exercise and everything else. And I think now it's much more about a holistic approach to eating that incorporates lots of different, you know, types of nutrients. We talk about protein, we talk about, um, you know, some of these different macros and, you know, people's attitudes towards what a diet is are very different today than what they used to be. A diet just used to mean low calorie and depriving yourself of, you know, of any kinds of sweets or anything else. Wellness is really about not depriving yourself, just things in moderation, about looking holistically at your life and how you're impact you're you're injecting enjoyment into your life maybe just in moderation you know where necessary right. yeah i think it's very much a body mind and spirit thing i mean that's if you think of everything as body mind and spirit it opens up so much more and 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 what it's done is it's enabled the industry to speak to people who just want to sleep better because i mean right. better for you know because that's so you know we've spent the last couple of years talking about how important sleep is to overall health it, it, you know, and, and right now, so much tension around the house, just all being, you know, either being stuck in it by yourself or being cramped with other people. Sometimes it may be an atomizer that, you know, uh, or a diffuser that just helps you kind of calm, meditate. You know, so housework becomes a part of so many of those processes and we're smart enough to engage ourselves. Well, there used to be a clinical kind of feeling to wellness products, and I think it's transcended that in recent years where it's really now about aspiration. It's not just about preventative wellness. It's really about living your life and aspiring to live your life. And you measure, you, you have a methodology for measuring trends. You call it trend viability mapping. And uh, the consumer aspiration score for wellness is, is a 10, which is the highest score possible. Uh, ha hasn't it always been that important? Or what's, what's, what's different now? Tom? Um, I think that, you know, I mean, it's, it's when we started out, it, it aspirational was always was always very high and all of these are ranked on sort of one to ten in terms of their intensity or their importance in moving the trend forward aspiration people have always wanted to be healthy i think one of the things that's really pushed that over the over the top is that we used to see wellness as something that was limited to very literal sort of physical fitness like you could look at somebody and see whether they were well or not well but the aspiration to be well has really amped up because there, a lot of people have gotten very much in touch with their, with, you know, with their um, sort of own body type, you know, so it's not about I have to be skinny or I have to be muscular or I have to, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of a body type you have. And that's enabled people to say, you know what, I'm not going to focus on just my body type. I'm going to, I want to be more calm. I want to be more well holistically. Um, when you look at the same chart, you know, let's, let's sort of overlay um, what COVID has done to the trend. You see that 
what's done is just what Leanna and Joe were both just talking to, that rational need, that thing of like now, it's not just, I'm not just aspiring to it. To get through this, I've got to be healthier, you know, or I put on weight. I've got to get rid of that, you know, the COVID-19, the joke being the 19 pounds you've put on since the pandemic started, you know, um, except of course for Joe and Leanna, who both managed to lose weight, but, um, you know, and the category breath has expanded too. You know, and Joe, you can speak to that, you know, but category breath and house force has really broadened. Joe, on, on the category <laughs> breath, you alluded to that earlier. Uh, I mean, is, is there one or two things that stand out right now which kind of demonstrate the, the expansion of wellness as a driver uh, post-pandemic, if you will, from a product sales standpoint? Well, just one of the things we are becoming much more, for lack of a better word, germaphobic and our concerns about viruses and stuff. So there's a lot of innovation that's happening in the cleaning space that allow people to really feel a little bit safer to help kind of manage that environment and control it. So we, we see some movement in this space and that just adds an extra variable and adds category breath to go with it. I will say, uh, you know, going back to some of the things you mentioned before, health and wellness has always been present, but it's just gotten broader and broader the definition. And then in the pandemic, it even got broader. Um, one of the big reasons why though it's changed a lot is in 2008 and nine, when the recession hit, that younger generation who was the heaviest restaurant consumers, or put another way, all the people who spoke a good game about health and wellness, but they didn't act on it. They moved home and started eating at home and doing all those things. So compared to other generations, they actually acted on it. So now you have that generation, the other growing part of the older population whose attitude and behavior were always close as it relates to health and wellness also acted on it and all the new moms. So part of it is just the demographics really pushed it with a big part being that millennial group that did it. Now, one of the things that's interesting that's really changed is over the past 30 years, the number one diet has always been my own diet, always been my own. But ironically, in the last month or two, some of the more of the structured diets are starting to get back in. And I don't know if it's because the consumer chaos that's going on. And in this space here, they actually want a little bit more control. I think in the long run, we'll get back to people wanting to have that broader lifestyle. But it's interesting that in the short term here, uh, we're seeing the consumers in this space look for a little bit more structure, but that depth is still there. So it opens up the different categories and the rational part of it because they're looking for guidance. Well, Leanna, speak more to the generational aspect of this, uh, uh, kind of picking up on what Joe said. Again, I think we tend to uh, historically pigeonhole generations when we talk about product trends. It's for this group, it's for that group. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems like the, the industry has to be sensitive that yes, while there might be variables that affect one group more than the other, the need and the opportunity here is to try to talk to as many people as possible uh, and, and, and exploit the fact that wellness is now this universal uh, concept. And, and also that all people are vetting wellness a little more seriously. I think you have, the industry has a responsibility now, not just to talk about wellness, but almost to demonstrate that it's uh, the efficacy or the effectiveness or the value. Talk a little bit about, from your point of view, all those things. Yeah, I mean, from a generational standpoint, um, you know, and thinking particularly about the younger generations that are driving some of this, I don't think uh, we can overlook some of the things that were already true before COVID, which is that, um, you know, number one, that folks are living longer and they're putting off major milestones, right? So they're doing things later in life. So there's kind of this, this desire to, you know, stay young, maybe longer than you might have, you know, maybe than your parents were when they did the same thing. But the other piece of it um, has to do with the cost of healthcare and health insurance and everything else and the disparity between the rise in that cost and the, you know, um, and the, the income of folks, especially at the younger ages. I've noticed a huge shift in the last probably five to seven years of people who I hire who are, you know, millennials and they are foregoing traditional health insurance because they don't want to pay for it in favor of doing more of their own kind of preventative care programs, right? So rather than paying for what if something bad happens, they're taking on the responsibility to say, I'm going to take care of myself in a way that makes sure I minimize the possibility of something bad happening. Right. So, you know, what does that do? That calls into play all kinds of different products and services that in the home and housewares industry we can participate in. We talked about air purifiers. We talk about things that get rid of allergens, you know, all of those kind of day-to-day, -day, you know, nuisances that, you know, really interfere with trying to be preemptively, um, 
you know, it's to be, uh, be uh, preventative wellness as opposed to, to later. We did talk a bit as we were putting the report together about there is some generational divide, right? Because you have that among some of the younger folks. But then you have people who, you know, were in the prime of their life in the 80s, and they got some repair to do now, right? I mean, they, they really, they really messed themselves up there, but I'm um, not looking at anyone in particular, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 let me build on what Leanna said. Uh, it's absolutely true. I mean, I, I don't want to say, when, when we say generational relevance is high, that does mean that ev almost every generation is thinking about this, okay? And almost every generation has a focus on wellness right now. That said, you know, when you're talking to younger generations, their focus is very preventative. They want to do what they can, as Liana said, to ameliorate healthcare costs or avoid them entirely by just living right, you know? Whereas, um, you know, so if, if you think of sort of, you know, the younger generations as being proactive um, and uh, you think of the sort of the middle of the group, the Gen Xers as being sort of somewhat, um, somewhat restorative and, and you know, and, and older generations as being reactive. You know, we're trying to fix the things that we that we overdid or underdid before. You know, so and that means different types of products. Some things are a quick fix, and some things are more of a lifestyle fix. And you know, and housewares can speak into any one of those of those issues. But you really do have to think about what generation you're appealing to because the approach to the diet alone. I mean, there's there are lots of statistics in the report that you can see, but. You know the the attitudes towards towards diet very very different. You know, right. I mean, boomers love certain things to eat. You know, so and boomers may you know are much less rational about portion control, whereas younger generations are much better about portion control. You know, so it's it's sort of uh, and they offset a lot, it with a lot of physical exercise. So read the report. I mean, it's just it's really it gives a lot of great information. Hey Peter, I got one thing I want to just add to this real quick is is call out because it's a subtle change that is different. If, if you're a, a boomer, you will understand this. If you, when you were in your 20s, the number of organic conversations out of the hundred that you would have with your parents or grandparents that was about health and wellness was small. If it was, it was probably your parent or grandparent complaining about something. If you think about the nature of the relationship between boomers and Xers with their kids, it's a more conversational thing that happens. So if you think or the number of organic conversations out of 100 that are about health and wellness, where right. both parties are interested, is so much more. So it really gives us an opportunity that while each generation's needs are different, this is a fundamental need that can connect the two generations for different purposes. And it really is a great way to sell products to multiple generations. Well, yeah, I know, I know, you know, I always tell my kids, I, uh, I have young adult daughters. You know, I've always told them, be careful and, and do the right thing. But you're right, more than ever, that, that conversation is, is deeper when it comes to doing the right thing and being safe and being well. I think the whole idea has been raised to this higher level of consciousness and awareness, which is, again, the ultimate thing that's gonna tie all these opportunities together. And, and from a product standpoint, you've all mentioned how, uh, Wellness is physical, it's mental, it's spiritual. It's so many uh, elements that, that kind of contribute to wellness. Uh, yet from a product standpoint, it's important, I think, to note that pro prioritizing simplicity and convenience is still going to be an important uh, advantage when it comes to product development. You're gonna have to provide uh, information and analysis that's easily digestible. Well, let's start talking. Let's talk about that 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 idea. Uh, without it being too clinical, you have to provide information and analysis. Joe, we'll stay with you. What's going on from a product standpoint with regard to making wellness easier to digest and understand? Well, in the report, one of the things they wanted to talk about was the ability for information analysis to be used by the consumer. And I love what you talked about right there, which is it still has to be easy. So I give the example. There was a while back when Fitbits were really hot and we started making scales that connected to the Fitbits and it was phenomenal. But then at some point there was an update, whether on your iPhone or your Android or somewhere along the app got an update somewhere along the line and then there was a disconnect. So one of the things we have to do is make sure that, it, that the products that if we're gonna to try to measure if there's some sort of smart capability that is easily adjustable and adaptable. 
If it is not smart related, then anything that can help the consumer measure, you talked about kitchen scales or things that allow you to be a little bit more precise in how you do things, but something that will help in that part of it is there because a lot of times people are going to want to be able to measure or track and go with what they have. The yeah, thing, Tom, Tom, go ahead. You know, I, I think we have to, you know, one of the things we have to acknowledge that didn't, didn't, we haven't raised yet is fitness is fitness and wellness has become very social and very, I mean, uh, you know, Joe and Leon are actually a great example. If I can objectify them for a minute, because before any of these webinars start, they're always talking about been on the same diet, which Leanna started and she really, you know, isn't even recognizable anymore. She looks amazing. And then Joe started it because he noticed her and they're talking about, I mean, these are things that, you know, well, we, what about me, Tom? Well, you know, you just, you tan really well. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. The, the thing is when you, what, what Joe's talking about also, is there's a certain point where the language moves beyond something that's, that's, that's social. In other words, when we were talking about BMI, okay, when my sister calls and she says, she said, it's not a curiosity, what's your BMI? When, when I finished telling her it was none of her business, I was like, you know, BMI is something, when did we even start talking about those things? So the language, we have to keep, keep the language of technology within a place where it can still be socialized. You know, I mean, there is um, this, this information is, are things that we share. We talk about our health a lot right. out of concern, out of, you know, bragging and all of that. And so products can help us do that. You know, when you've got some, when you've got a product that gives you information and you can say, I'm sleeping X percent better. You know, you have mattresses now that can tell you how many times you move a night. How, how good is your sleep? Liana, you look like you're, you're I have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was you, you, you're hitting on something that's really near and dear. I know both to myself and Joe, as we've kind of talked about our, you know, recent, um, you know, dieting journeys, which is about um, data and about watching things change over time on a personal basis, right? So, you know, it, it's not enough to say, okay, you know, I know that my weight has decreased by this many pounds. I know how much my body fat decreased. I know how much my muscle mass increased or decreased. I know about my... Um, you know, all these different aspects of myself that as I've gone through this process, I've been able to watch change over time. It's really interesting. Um, and there's products out there. You know, certainly the smart scales do some of that, but there's a product that I ran across that was related to folks who wanted to do keto, right? And there's this whole thing where you're, if you do keto, you want to be in ketosis and, you know, and it's very different for different people. What throws you in and out of that? So there's a device that you use that measures your degree, your level of ketos ketones, ketosis that you're in. And it pairs with an app that you keep track of what you're eating. And then you, you use this little device at different times. And over time, it learns and tells you what works for you, what throws you out of ketosis and what helps you maintain it. And it becomes a very personal data-driven, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And the same thing for things you mentioned, you mentioned, you know, sleeping better, this or that. Anytime you can kind of watch yourself kind of improve in different areas or how things change, I think it's really fascinating for the consumer. Yeah, I think it's one of the things. I was saying personalization is one of those ideas that kind of transcends all, the, all of the uh, trends yeah. that we're talking about. And I think when, when information can be personalized or at least feel to be personalized is when you begin to de deconstruct the complexity of it and it starts to resonate. Smart, smart, for instance, Joe, I know you've said this before, smart appliances and housewares really had a tough time taking off because, you know, did we really need something that was going to do this without me being involved? But when it comes to personal health, that's where it makes a difference. And we saw smart applications really take off uh, when you attach them to personal health. I interrupted yeah. you, Joe. Go ahead. No, 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 you're good. Uh, but it, it, building on that, like there are a lot of things that are coming down the road. We talked about before how it's really the major appliances are starting to do some things. Well, we also see a case where there's companies like Viomi and 23andMe and all them that are using that personalization that you're talking about to give you specific dietary recommendations that then can be fed in through the major appliances and ultimately down to the small appliances and housewares that really organize what you should be eating for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, based off of what you have on hand. Like this is all coming maybe 10 years from now. But in right. addition to that, 
besides what's happening from the consumer side, there's also just the operational efficiency and effectiveness of products. So think of those air purifiers that now have the ability to monitor uh, allergens within rooms and adjust if they're mobile to go between room and room that what is with it, it can really spend its energy and time in those areas that have the greater need as opposed to you just hoping and, and just putting it wherever you think it is. So part of the efficiency, there's, there are pillows that uh, follow whether you're snoring or some apnea with it that are adjusting to keep people going. So using the technology, not only just for the consumer, but the technology, the ability to help you live that healthier part using that data analysis to adjust its own operation. The, the, the hairstyling products that measure the water and control the heat with it. There's just so many little things and nuances where that is driving the usage of products. Does, that, yeah, does anyone else have anything to add on the idea of controlling your environment a little bit more carefully by eliminating those things that may be bad, allergens, irritants, uh, I, mean, I, I, I think certainly back to the, you know, the, the data point, I think be able, being able to actually read that, recognize that, and then adjust accordingly, whether it's the device doing it automatically or whether it's you as the user being able to do it. Um, is important. And I think becomes, this is where I think some of what, you know, what we've experienced these past few months with this pandemic really becomes critical. And going back to um, the last slide that we were on, this idea that the rational need of wellness has increased. Well, it's not that it was never rational before, right? I mean, you, you want to be healthy, you want to be well, you want to enjoy your life. But the, the fear that the presence of COVID-19 has injected into all of our lives has created a kind of you know, some of it, yes, is about I want to be well, but some of it is I have to pay attention to this stuff and I have to understand what's going on because we are in the middle of a once in a century situation where, you know, we have to protect our health and, and well being. Right. Um, so, being able to control your environment, I think, really speaks to um, that kind of fear that people have of what's going on right now. What's going yeah, on? Fear can now. paralyze, but fear can also motivate. Yes. And I think we're seeing that latter. Kind of take hold in the last few months. Uh, Tom, any other thoughts on that? Well, I, 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 I mean, exactly. You know what Liana just said. I, I feel like we, we, we look at aspirational as being sort of. Um, I don't want to say the nice to have, but it, it is really. I mean, the aspirational is the nice to have, and you know the, the, the <laughs> functional part of it is really the, the look. It's it's life or death. Okay, now I'm literally talking about whether I'm going to be alive or not. I'm protecting my life, and that's why it's become so important. But eliminating wellness detriments as one of the three points that we've identified, I think a lot of people think of, um, think of, of wellness as achieving something, and it's very easy to leave out the elimination of something. Elimination mm -hmm. is really important, whether they're you know, and making that measurable because measurability really makes a product more adoptable. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's exactly the conversation that Joe and Liana are having. It's that, well, what, what are the, what are the talking points here? What are the data points? Because I don't want to be ruled by data, but if it's not measurable, then it's just, I'm talking inside my head, you know? So make sure that what the product you're delivering, you know, gives you X percent clearer air, cleaner air, mm -hmm. you know, eliminates this many contaminants, you know, delivers, product that, you know, reduces fat this amount, you know, it's got to be something, you know, we, you've got to focus on making it measurable. Measurable is right. super. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. You talk about eliminating products that, that kind of eliminate bad things, these elements. Uh, you know, wellness is also extends to the general environment. Environmental wellness is personal wellness. And uh, it's not, again, it's, it, ha it has a broader application and a broader reach. Do you think uh, companies, Joe, do you think companies are, are more aware of how they manufacture their products, that the methods that go into the, the materials they use, and all of the elements involved in producing something that is perceived to be safer and better for you? Yeah, I think we're on that path. I think there's still more to go. I mean, if you think about it, it, it initially was that millennial generation who basically said, it's not just eating fruits and vegetables, they got to be organic fruits and vegetables. Like, so how a product was manufactured started to become part of that wellness component and it took off from there. And so it got into the materials, whether it's in food storage, whether it's in coffee, whether whatever the, the vehicle is, it gets in there. We're gonna have a session coming up here with responsibility and there's kind of a little bit of that tie that goes with it. So 
I think that is the path that we started to go on. It took a little bit of time, but that certainly isn't in the equation now. That wasn't in the, in the equation before. Um, and now that as it's doing that, then naturally manufacturers are starting to hear that from consumers. They're trying to understand how that can be a differentiator. So they're looking at the ways they're manufacturing things to be part of it and trying to eliminate anything that could be negative and ideally find something that could be positive. Leanna, on a value standpoint, this isn't something we necessarily talked about earlier, but it, Joe's commentary and Tom's commentary lead me to ask the question, are consumers prepared to pay more? in your opinion, for products that are, are delivering on all of these wellness uh, variables. Obviously, cost efficiency is, is, an, is an important element too, but is, there, is, is it worth more to consumers? Let's start with you. Yeah, I, I think that especially right now, I think that it is. Um, but I want to caveat that by saying what I just uh, written as a note as Joe was talking, which is, you know, the rational aspect of this right now and the kind of critical nature of wellness right now also doesn't leave a lot of room for BS claims, right? I mean, there was, I probably bought a, my first air purifier probably 15 years ago, and I don't really know if it did anything, you know, and it was kind of neither here nor there. Um, but there's, I don't think there's a lot of tolerance for kind of, you know, these, the claims that don't prove themselves out. And I think that's where some of the data comes in, some of the measurement comes in. But I think that if those things are in place, I think that the mindset of consumers right now is that spending money on things that provide wellness, that give control over the environment, that make them feel, again, you know, part of it is mental wellness. Do I feel safe in my environment? Do I feel secure in my environment? Do I feel, you know, protected? I think all of that is a major priority right now. Tom, does there have to be some proof, though, uh, some tangible proof with it? I think there are some things that we that we can't prove, okay? I mean, there are always going to be some things like, look, I don't know, I don't know how I don't know how effective the HEPA filter is in my vacuum, okay? Uh, there, there are certain things that, that reach beyond that, but I think part, part of proof is in the living it. If you don't start feeling better, if you don't start mm -hmm. seeing an improvement, then, if, you know, then it's gonna fall off in terms of a priority. Right. That said, you know, one of the things that's really interesting to me about delivering environmental control, and if you look back to this conversation we've been having, we don't talk, when we talk about the environment now, we talk about our home environment. COVID has really, it's really raised the bar on what we, we are feeling less and less, you know, as, as human beings, we know what we can and cannot control. And right now, COVID-19 has told us the environment here, these four, 10, 12 walls are what we can control. So let's control that as best we can. Let's control the healthfulness of the wellness of that environment, the healthfulness of it in terms of the food we serve, the food we eat, what we make, you know, the, the way we clean, because out there is scary now. So things that really help you create your haven, your, your fortress of wellness, so to speak, those are the products that we commit to, because it's about us, it's about our family, it's about the people inside our walls, the people we care about, and being there for them, both our own wellness and their wellness. It's interesting, statistically, when we start seeing um, some of the stats crawling up about, we're, we're concerned about our wellness, but the numbers in terms of the other, of people we care about inside our household have really, you know, we, it's everybody. I mean, not the parents haven't always cared about their children, but the level of conversation about it is intense, you know, so. You know. Well, and certainly I think Joe has seen some things, you know, just in tracking product purchases and consumer behavior, you know, the way people gravitated and flocked towards the home as a source of, you know, of comfort and, and, um, and focus but the things that they bought to occupy that space. Go ahead, Joe. So is there a, is there a trade up going on uh, as well as becomes a little bit more, more important? Yeah, well, I wanna add to the conversation, can you charge more in, in, in that part? Right. If it solves a need, yes. But I, I gotta caution us a little bit. I, when, I, when I was in the food business, almost every manufacturer at some point would try to sell through their organization something that would be healthier than what it was before. And they'd try to, they'd sell it through that they're going to do at a premium and it would fail. So we've got to be cautious on it. If you think about it, if you order a, a full a regular milk or 2% milk, it's the same price. So if we're going to do something that's healthy, it's still got to be within spitting distance. But I think the bigger issue is this, and it's the lesson that I use a lot of times is if any of you guys ever had the McLean burger, if you remember that back in the 90s, yeah. it was going to come out. This is going to be healthy. And it came out with a burger. Everybody ate one. 
just one because it was horrible. <laughs> and, then, and then they said, well, health and wellness doesn't work in the restaurant industry. Well, that's not true. It's just that the quality of the product was not there. And you can see now health and wellness was doing very well in the restaurant industry. So it's a case where that if we're going to put something through, the most important thing is, does it deliver on the promise? Right. And then if we can get the pricing within spitting distance of whatever it would be replacing, that's fine. It doesn't have to be the same, but it's got to be, it can't, you can't suddenly go, well, this is 20 and this is a thousand. It's just not going to happen. Right. And I think to Tom's point earlier, your body is going to tell you, uh, your life is going to tell you whether the products you believe are, uh, better for your health and wellness are working. So there, it, it's not going to be very forgiving uh, to those companies uh, and those products that ultimately don't uh, live up to those promises, which is always a, a major issue when it comes to trying, when you get close to selling kind of health care products without them being bona fide, you know, health care. Sometimes you have to be real careful how close you get to the sun, but they got to work and your body's going to tell you. At the end of the day, the retailer still holds the key in many of these cases in terms of communicating these products and their benefits and the idea of wellness to the consumer. So as we kind of shift over to the, the retail implications for this, a lot of this is going to talk, we're going to bring in other trends. Uh, how do retailers offer wellness experiences uh, for their, and how, how do they cross merchandise wellness products? And ultimately, how do they make sure they're not selling a product that is not good for you. That's wellness adverse. Let's start with uh, retail experiences. Tom, I'm, I'm going to go to you on this one. Uh, what, what, what is a, an effective wellness experience going to be and how do you achieve that at the retail level? Well, I think, you know, a part of, you know, uh, a part of, a part of the retail experience has become ratings and reviews. So, you know, as soon as we can, you know, that's one of the things that we, that we look at first. So this is, it's why early adoption is important, you know, and making sure that, that that you're reaching people and that they're commenting on your product and that, you know, uh, but in terms of offering the physical experiences, look, it's always going to be a challenge to have a retail environment where you are able to see all that the product offers, all that it can do. Um, you know, I think it puts, I think it puts a lot of importance on, on packaging. You, know, you talked about cross merchandise, but before we even get to that, it's that the packaging has to explain First, it has to address, like a lot of times you'll see reference to keto, for example, okay? If you don't know what that is, I mean, I know that I bought, you know, keto, keto positive ice cream, okay, for like three months before I even knew what it was, but it was because I'd heard other people talking about it and it was like, okay, but at a point you have to say, okay, what exactly is this? You know, so explanation is important so that you're not just driving purchasing across the audience that already understands it, but you're engaging new people and you're telling them what it's about. Um, also, I think retail has a responsibility to create sort of neighborhoods of solutions so that if you're living, if you, if you go into a grocery, I was working with a, with a, a grocery company and, and um, one of the things that they, they were saying, okay, we, you know, how do we embrace the person who is, you know, trying to uh, really make the keto diet work for them? And it's like, okay, well, first, You've got to put it all together. You can't have, you've got to create a place that says, I do this. Just like when you're doing, you know, wellness of home food prep, you have stories, you tell stories, neighbor, you create neighborhoods of solutions where everything you need to live that way is right there. You know, it's right. in a safe place. I mean, is, is, it, is it, this is a place where you have to sort of connect the digital opportunity to the point of purchase opportunity. If you can provide more information at point of purchase in, in, to sort of enhance the experience by enhancing the person's knowledge of what they're looking at. Um, it, let's, call, let's go back to the packaging. Are, is the industry doing a good job with packaging or does it still have a lot of work left? I want to stay on you for that, for Tom, for a second. I think, I think that some people in the industry are doing a great job. No, I mean, I think that, I think that, look. What are the mistakes that are being made, do you think? I think? I think it's underdoing more than anything else. I mean, I think, look, we have to acknowledge the fact that you know, we don't like to st stand there and read things, okay? So I think you have to have engaging, you know, I think you have to have engaging visuals, things that really tell you what this product is going to be like, what it's going to be like in my home, what it's going to be like in my life, and that it's easy. Because ease is, is still a really important point of adoption or refusal, you know? So if I can make something easy, I mean, you look at grocery right now. I was in Whole Foods yesterday, and they've got uh, you know, they've got an entire freezer case that's just blends that you can just 
pour into your, um, you know, so that you can make yourself a healthy smoothie without having to do all the blending in advance. It's already right. chopped to the right size and it's all, all you have to do is pour it in, turn it on and that's it, you're done. You know, and that's, uh, you know, so that's an example of, you see, you see the packaging right there. It tells you just ready to blend. And that to me is, you know, so what I think, you know, we're looking at some of the products on the screen, you know, that, that tell you as soon as you see them, wow, this is something I can make happen. This is the product I can create with it. This, it's going to be gorgeous. It's going to be good for me. And the more you can do that, the better off you're going to be because there's not always somebody there to explain it. Now more than ever, there is not someone there to talk you through the purchase process. You're talking yourself through it. Lena, what's your thought on the experience opportunity in wellness? Again, it, it can be complicated, but it doesn't have to be difficult, uh, if, that, if that makes sense. Uh, right. uh, go ahead. I, I think what's important to note is that wellness, you know, not that any of the other trends that we're talking about don't have some degree of this, but more so than any of the rest of them, wellness is really a lifestyle. And, you know, to some people, it's an all-encompassing lifestyle and everything they do, you know, connects back to it. And for some people, it's just some ancillary, you know, bits and pieces of their life. But anytime a retailer can tap into that lifestyle and create and you know and identify with the consumer and with their desire to lead a more uh, wellness forward life, I think that creates affinity for the retailer as well as for the products being sold. So just a couple of examples, you know, um, I know that there is, and I'm I'm not going to recall exactly the brand, but I know that there's at least one grocery. Um, retailer who has started to spin off smaller stores where they're partnering with Orange Theory Fitness. And they are, you know, so you've got Orange Theory Fitness and people can go to their exercise class. And then afterwards, there's a smaller subset. It's not the, the whole grocery store. It's a subset of the grocery store that is, you know, wellness, food, and beverage focused. And it creates an association in the consumer's mind of this is a, this is a grocery store brand that aligns with my lifestyle, with my desire to lead a wellness forward lifestyle. And when you look at cross merchandising wellness products, that's the other part of it. It's not just about, you know, a lot of times you, you look at displays or you look at how stores are set up and they're set up by areas in the home or they're set up by product categories, but you don't always see things set up by lifestyle. And, you know, some, and this is just merchandising. This is just saying, okay, if somebody is interested in this wellness focused product, it's very likely because it's a lifestyle and it's not just incidental, very likely they're also going to be interested in these other wellness types of products. So how do you bring those things together and help connect with the consumer at a lifestyle level? Joe, on the idea of cross merchandising as it relates to creating a, a, a broader lifestyle experience, one of the challenges at the retail management level is that you've got historically uh, product categories that may have been in silos uh, from a buying responsibility standpoint. And there's a need for uh, retailers to kind of break down those silos and connect. Uh, online e-commerce has done a better job of doing that because they're not confined by uh, the real estate or the hard space. From, from your standpoint, what's the best way to create a cross-merchandised lifestyle, ex lifestyle experience in wellness that will be executed and work at the store level. Well, it's, it's one of the things that is a real challenge that they have. You know, there's a lot of history behind that and there's a lot of logic and reason behind it. However, uh, the answer lies into, is there going to be an adjustment into the reward system? Is there going to be adjustments in how people are measured? But probably the biggest thing is just to sit there and focus on the consumer because they're still going to do it with or without us. And the bigger question is, can you keep them all in store? So for example, the prime dieting months are March and June. So if somebody is going to go in June, they're probably going to be also adding exercise to their thing. So they're going to need clothing and footwear and that goes with it. There's going to be things that are going to be managing the environment, whether it's the floor care or the air purifiers that we talked about. It's going to be the foods that they're going to try to eat, those homemade foods. So how do we, so this connection that goes across the store is going to happen by the consumer with or without us. And so as long as that focusing on the overall sales and profitability of the retailer and trying to keep all that as much as they can in house or at a minimum in a partnership relationship that they have is, is what Leanna talked about. Um, that's going to be the ultimate goal for them. And I'll, I'll give one more thing that you talked about with packaging before is it, it could be as simple and this is cross merchandising, but it's also just a, it's into the devil is in the details is right now. 
when, when food manufacturers come out with how to heat an item, ideally, right, they'll probably have a stovetop and they might have something, they may or may not have a grill, right? But there's all these other appliances that are being bought. How do they make it precise? Should that be on the food manufacturer's packaging? Should that be on our packaging? Mm -hmm. Is there a way to do it at the shelf? Is there, is there another vehicle from a marketing perspective that maybe the retailer could communicate back to the person to help them understand? But just that collaboration, what Leanna talked about, whether it's with Orange Theory, whether it's with food manufacturers, or with its, whether it's with the other departments within my store, the consumer is trying to do one thing and we just gotta help them. We have to keep the focus. Let's start with the consumer first and then work our way backwards. Tom, any more thoughts on, on, on sustaining that connection throughout the assortment, throughout the, the store environment, uh, so that you know, it doesn't look like an amalgamation of products. It looks like a, a whole story, if you will. I, well, I think we've talked about, uh, I, I think we've made the point about, about telling, telling stories and creating neighborhoods yeah. of sleep, um, you know, it, it, inside that, uh, because it also helps you cross sell and it helps you look at, okay, well, I am living healthy this way, but have I considered this? Have I considered the air in my home now that I've considered the water in my home, you know, or, or, or whatever that is. But I think beyond that, the retail, I think one of the, the, things that some retailers have taken really bold, bold moves like CVS eliminating, um, eliminating cigarettes and, uh, you know, uh, and I think that those types of things that where you're talking health in one message, uh, you know, out of one side of your mouth, but your assortment is saying that you support, you know, not so healthy, you know, or known, uh, known unhealthy aspects of lifestyle. Those are, those are important, and it doesn't just go to product. Um, it's something we're really seeing, you know, right now, it's super important for, I mean, I, I, won't, I won't say what the name of the chain is, but a major grocery chain, there are two, um, two of them near my place. And uh, so, and I'll go into the store, and they have, uh, either they, they have, you know, arrows in the aisles that they're not really sticking to, and they're not making customers stick to it. They've got people restocking the right. shelves, not wearing masks. And it's like, okay, now wait a minute. You've got a sign up on the front door that says, I can't come in here without a mask, which I completely support. But then your own staff is enforced to wear masks. Right. You know, what kind of message are you sending here? So, I mean, it's living it end to end. Yeah, and wellness right now is not just about the products you carry. It's about the care you show of me as yeah. someone walking into your store. Yeah, it's like earlier we talked about, you have to, as a manufacturer, you have to be concerned about what goes into the product you make and how that uh, represents the, the wellness identity. The retailer has to understand that now more than ever, shopper loyalty is taking into account so many more variables and the ability to create a safe environment a, is going to be uh, an important part of that no matter what products you're selling in there. Uh, on, Joe, on the idea of kind of eliminating these products that don't contribute to your, your overall, the overall wellness of society, if you will, is, is, is are retailers beginning to understand that it's, it's beyond COVID. It's really going to be a way of, uh, of merchandising indefinitely right now. I think retailers are getting better and better at trying to connect those dots. I think the one thing that I'd be thinking about is we as an industry, both retailers and manufacturers, have to be on the offensive here. And I'll, I'll give a story that uh, a while back there when the Obamas were in the White House and Mrs. Obama was doing her Let's Move, it transformed the food industry. Every, and so in, in working in Washington, D.C. as well, every, there are conferences all over the board on how to help battle obesity, how to help manage things. And I remember one of the times speaking there about how people are eating. And you had, I was looking in the audience in the task force and it's like it's educating people on the value of fruits and vegetables. It was all the government folks, so all the food manufacturers and the government folks. And I'm like, that's not the problem. And that's when the light hit me right there. It's like saying, the problem is, I don't know how to execute on it. We all know we need to eat fruits and vegetables. We don't know how to execute on it. And if I'm uh, somebody who is working two jobs and in, in, in an area just trying to make ends meet, I don't have the time. So yes, you can put all the fruits and vegetables available in front of me, but if I don't have the time to prepare them or to cook the meals, it is there. So I think one of the things we, the manufacturers collaborating with the retailers is trying to sit there and understand at the fundamental things to be able to live a healthy life, 
it falls upon our industry. The ability to execute is the biggest thing that we miss. And so when we develop our technologies and we develop those things, don't just develop in a vacuum, develop with a purpose. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to help the consumer what help live that healthy life, which is varied, what can we do to tie into it? It is really incumbent upon us. And the good news is if we do it right, it can spur growth for another 20 generation, 20 years. I mean, it's just, it's critical for us. Leanna, a lot of what Joe's talking about, Tom, and you, you've, you've, you've talked a lot about the food industry and food retailers that have almost on some level been ahead of the curve in understanding this. And during the pandemic, if you were a food retailer, you were an essential retailer, you were open, including the large mass merchants. Uh, uh, this connection to food is something that I think is interesting when you talk about the housewares industry. Do you think there's uh, more to learn from watching uh, that industry? I know Joe, what Joe feels about it. I'll get to him in a second. But is, is there more to learn really by looking outside our industry a little bit and looking at those industries that may have been ahead of the curve in terms of understanding what constitutes a healthy life and, and, how to, and to Joe's point, how to execute it at the... Uh, the, the purchasing level and, and and is the industry is this industry ready to kind of look beyond its own borders yeah. i think the house sorry oh. i think the house mortgage industry is, is definitely and i'm sure leanna will talk to that but i just want to say that internal hierarchies at retail really can interfere with the process you know what i mean i'll give you a great example of, of you know it's like People are people guard their space and and you know what floor space they have and I think that they need to be as proactive about thinking of the consumer's health when it comes to health and wellness products as they are about you know uh, when they think about just the you know you know you walk to a store and somebody says you know help yourself to some you know to some uh, uh, you know hand sanitizer and I feel like saying I'd rather help myself to a brownie but okay but you know when you walk into I'll give you a great example when Target when when Target puts together a um, a series uh, of um, where they put together a uh, you know a, a juicing um, you know or a smoothie story. They've got the they've got the juicers and the juice extractors right next to cutting boards that are paired with knives and cutlery. So it's like they're telling you a story, but they're letting you pick it all up right there very quickly. And it's not honestly for them. Their attitude is not so much about the cross sell. The cross sell will take care of itself if you start thinking about consumers and product in the way people really live, as opposed to categorically. And sometimes those walls can really right. get away. We got to break that. We got to tear down those walls. Leanna, back to the point of the industry looking beyond itself, and maybe what the association is is thinking about as it explores the connection between its products and what we said is just a way of life right now. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one, one thing that I'll draw on there is some of my background. Before I was with the International Housewares Association, I spent a number of years with the National Restaurant Association. Right. And certainly from a, you know, creativity standpoint and trying new things, you know, it's hard to beat some of these chefs, you know, who are doing really interesting and unique things in restaurants. And we used to say at the Restaurant Association that anything you saw at our show or that you saw happening in the restaurant industry was, was anywhere from two to five years away from landing in the consumer's home. And you know, one, one example of it that I just remember living through was, um, uh, was sous vide, right? As a new cooking technique. And it was all the rage with Wiley Dufresne and the molecular gastronomy crowd and all of these guys, you know? And it, you know, it, it picked up some steam and then eventually it was, okay, well, how do we make that accessible to the home consumer, right? Okay, well, here's a sous vide machine that now you can have in your home. Well, as we've learned in some of our other trends here, it might not make sense to just lop a whole nother appliance into your home. So now you have, you know, the immersion circulators that you can use with different types of pots. So I think that it's incumbent upon us in the housewares industry to look at what's happening around us. And to Joe's point, which I love is make it accessible to the consumer, but do it in the context of the consumer and how they're living. Right. So one, you know, one of the pictures that's on the slide right now, the little, um, the zoodler or the zucchini noodles and all that kind of stuff, you know, when there's, you know, people are using jackfruit in place of barbecue. A lot of that stuff starts in restaurants and then, but there's a gap between when it gets from the restaurant to the consumer, because you have to create consumer friendly ways to execute that in the home. Is the gap shortening though? I know, I know you talked about two to five years. I get a sense that there's a lot of, uh, uh, activity in place that's probably try trying to compress that time from the professional food service or whatever the professional uh, application is to the home application. 
Yeah, I, I think that, that that was a range that we used to right, use right. just in terms of talking about it. But certainly I think there's a, you know, there, there's an escalation of that. And frankly, it's one of the reasons, you know, not only because I spent time, you know, with so many restaurateurs and just really fell in love with that industry, but also for what comes out of it and how it sparks creativity that, you know, that, that spills over into the, the home and housewares industry. You know, I, my, my sincere hope is that that industry recovers quickly and fully from what's right. going on here. Right, right, Joe, the, it's, it, instead of consumers, consumers may look to the food industry or to other uh, areas for their for advice on wellness, the medical industry, the, the, the healthcare industry, the pharmaceutical industry. It's, it, we need to make sure they know that they can look to the home and housewares industry for that type of advice too. What's your thoughts, Joe? I absolutely believe it. And I absolutely believe that we have a, a key role and we need to help be one of the leaders in this space. Because again, it's all about the execution. Now it's hard for retailers to do all this, I get it. Um, and I think they've made great strides in the past few years, but there's more to be done. So I think one of the things you had asked before, what could they be looking for outside? I'd be looking at two places that both Leanna and Tom talked about. The restaurant industry is always very, very agile and they're always very innovative, whether it's in the ordering process, whether it's in the uh, paying the bill process, whether it's in getting things home, however that is be looking outside. And if you look at it, especially look at the fine dining and those types of establishment is where a lot of times that creativity does. And if we're monitoring that, we can speed that cycle a little bit faster. The second thing, Tom talked a lot about the advancement that online is doing, which is really doing a nice job to speak to life moments, whether it's back to college, whether you're getting married, whatever the case, there's advancements that are happening online that we can use as a stimulus along with the restaurant industry to say, are there different ways to operate and execute in, internally? So while there's been innovation, I think there's more that can be done and looking outside to some of these other places is a great step to help inspire new creative ways. Um, I know when you put together a lot of your trend analysis, it's important for you to look outside. Uh, to speak, as we wrap up today, speak to kind of the influences that you look to and that you think this industry needs to look to in terms of finding new ways of approaching this kind of holistic wellness in the life. I, I think that, um, I think we really have to look at enabling social engage, enabling social media engagement. And I think that's whether we're, whether inside the industry we're creating a new product, you know, because it's, it's incredible, especially, especially with wellness. It's incredible the social chatter that goes on about it and how fast information, how quickly information is shared and disseminated and how quickly you find yourself talking about, well, have you seen this product or have you tried that product? Whether it's food or it's, you know, and, and you know, one thing that we had talked about last time was the, the ability to compare and contrast um, because that, that comparison happens in social media almost instantaneously, as soon as we have information about a new product, we start talking about it. So, but I think that as manufacturers, we, uh, you know, and as the industry, we have to, we have to become a part of that conversation and make sure that the message about our products and what they can do isn't just anecdotal, that we're providing plenty of information for consumers to turn to and learn about our product. You know, we know, and Joe's spoken about it in the past, and I know I have, about how many people look to manufacturers' websites, not just retailer websites, but manufacturers' websites before they make significant purchases. Mm -hmm. And I think that as that becomes more, more easy, faster, that it's, you know, that we have to be a part of the conversation instead of just letting people talk about our products. Um, we have to make sure that we give them the, in the truth and the information for them to talk about the products. Uh, reasonably and 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 you know rat, you know and with a lot of information. Thanks. Hey, it's interesting. One of our one of our viewers today brings up kind of a different aspect of wellness and the opportunity, and that's the fact that consumers have learned new skills during the pandemic, things that they have taken on themselves, whether it's cooking or and developing these new skills in and of themselves have have has kind of contributed to their mental well-being. They, they feel better about themselves. And I, I think sometimes we don't realize, we, we lose sight of the fact that our products are also enabler, enablers, if you will. Uh, so be, as we wrap up today, talk about that component, if you will, of kind of enabling consumers 
not just to take more control, but to do that successfully, to be, to, to be more skilled, to be more uh, equipped, if you will. Joe? I think that is one of the key pieces to get the execution is that we've got to figure out and understand what the consumers are doing and do everything we can have to help them enable that. So if I'm doing a keto and I'm trying to get my protein in the morning, what, do I, what are my options? Are there easier ways to do that? If I'm trying to get all my vegetables, are there easier ways to prepare, chop, and cut them? So we've got to be thinking about how we can enable. But I also like the, the question from whoever sent it in, because it's a great reminder. When we talk about looking outside of our industry, the first place we need to be looking at, though, is the consumer. The consumer has such creative hacks. There was somewhere here in the past uh, month or so where I, it was some celebrity cooking uh, and showing how they make their uh, uh, spaghetti sauce and pasta sauce, and they're just doing it live. And I'm seeing all these little hacks that they do to, to keep the pan tilted in a certain way, to move this around. Like, mm -hmm. so completely using the products, not the way it was designed, but they're trying to accomplish what they want. And the whole time, I just watched this three minute video and I'm going, there are four new products that we could create just by watching what this person is doing as a hack to solve it. So we should be looking to them, not only to help them and, and help inspire them, but in reality, if we watch them, they might inspire us. Joe is, is I got to say, Joe is so right. If you want to see some really interesting stuff, just go online and just, just Google housewares hacks or you know time-saving hacks, and you will see products that you should be creating. The consumer is the richest source. We've talked about it before, about you know, uh, you know, looking at uh, a crowdfunding and things like that. But people, people, people invent you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And we have a lot of necessities right now. And people are doing it. They're just doing it for themselves. So. And, that, that, and I guess I, I would say, too, just that, that wellness, as we're talking about, when we get into not just physical, but spiritual and mental and, and everything that goes along with that, you know, some of it is, and, and, and there's, I talk about the Venn diagrams between these trends, these five trends that we were, we're discussing, um, you know, and experience and wellness. You know, we talked about experience on our last session. Certainly, there's a there's a connection point here on you know the experience of discovering new ways to be well or other things. Right. And one of the points I made with experience was that some of it was just about enjoying yourself, right? Or just mm -hmm. just just having fun. And frankly, some of wellness is just about joy and happiness. You're feeling and good. Yeah. That is part of your wellness makeup. Yeah. Well. Uh, before we wrap up, Leanna, uh, I just I always give you an opportunity right now to discuss uh, kind of the strategy in terms of allowing people to uh, uh, get the Market Watch report. And, and uh, so get, why don't you remind them how they can get their hands on the Market Watch report? Yeah, you bet. So everyone who attended this webinar will receive a follow up email in about 24 hours. So about this time tomorrow. And it will include a link to download the full Market Watch report that was going to be released in March. Um, it also will include a link to our next session, which is this Thursday at 1 p.m. Central, and it's on responsibility. And, and in addition, there's some uh, in additional information in there about the International Housewares Association, about the NPD group, and about Springboard Futures. So keep a lookout for that tomorrow. Right. Well, I want to thank my uh, panelists today, Leanna, Joe, Tom. Uh, we didn't so much discuss wellness from the standpoint of corporate wellness and business wellness, but let me say that if this industry and its customers, its retail customers, continue to move the needle as they are in the idea of uh, offering uh, wellness solutions to their uh, consumers and listen to the consumer, it will contribute to corporate and fiscal wellness as well, which is obviously an important part of this. Uh, just a reminder, we're gonna we're gonna talk about. Uh, responsibility on Thursday at the same time, two, uh, two o'clock Eastern. That will be the final uh, trend that we discuss as it relates to the Market Watch report. Uh, so I hope you all tune in then, but that will not be the last session. Uh, the following Tuesday, we'll get together and we'll do a little bit of a recap of what we talked about the last uh, couple of weeks, and we'll try to put it in perspective uh, as to what's next and some things to look out for. So until Thursday at 2 o'clock when we talk about responsibility, I want to thank everyone for joining us. We'll see you then. Bye-bye now. Thanks. Bye.